Well, welcome and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming here to uh, start the ACC Marathon. Uh, congratulations on the start. I, uh, I'm Phil Adamson. I'm a heart failure cardiologist and the chief medical officer for the heart failure division here at Abbott, and I'm really pleased to moderate this faculty. This is a, uh, a group of people that we can all learn a tremendous amount from. Um, but before we start, can I ask for just a show of hands? It's hard to see from up here with all these paparazzi lights, but how, how many are general cardiologists in the audience? How many general cardiologists? Okay, good, good. Interventionalists? EPs, okay. How about nurse practitioners? Good, excellent, wonderful. Well, we have an opportunity today, actually, to, um, to really think differently. And I would really encourage you to think not only personalized, personalized, but I'd like for you to think integrated. Because this disease process of heart failure, the syndrome we all know is a the pandemic that is continuing while we paid attention to another pandemic, but lo and behold, it's still here. It's still dramatic. And I think many times we fail to tell our patients that at diagnosis, they have a 50% chance of dying within five years. One in nine deaths in the United States are as a result of heart failure or contributed to by heart failure, and this is a remarkably expensive process. And if we don't start to think of heart failure as pathophysiologists and integrate across the spectrum, I think we will lose an opportunity to bring efficiency and innovation to this disease. And in fact, I'm, I get up every morning so excited. <laughs> you can imagine, I started my life as, a, as someone investigating cardiac resynchronization therapy, being able to pull signals from those devices, and, and, and now have seen this it, this, this spectrum start from us bringing innovation to treat components of the pathophysiology of heart failure, but I'd like for you to start thinking, when I fix the left bundle branch block with a cardiac resynchronization therapy device, when do I follow up to see if the other components of that pathophysiology are still bothering the patient? When I fix the mitral valve, fixes, I'm using that word because I'm from Oklahoma, but well now Texas, so even, even better. I, I, I think that we can now think, okay, this is a component, let's find out what the next component, and even to cardiomems. When patients have refractory, secondary pulmonary hypertension, evidence of early right heart failure, that's the time to offload the left ventricle with a HeartMate 3. So this spectrum is the pathophysiology of heart failure, along with and, and hand in hand with guideline directed medical therapy targeting those neurohormonal mechanisms of disease, we now have opportunity to target the other components. We're gonna focus really on CardioMEMS and MitraClip today, and I wanna introduce our faculty. Um, and and I'm, again, I'm extraordinarily happy to introduce Matthew Price, who runs the cath lab and the, the cath services at Scripps Clinic in, in, in uh, San Diego. His colleague, Ajay Sirvastava, who's from Scripps as well in San, in, in San Diego, is an advanced heart failure specialist. And then we have Shashank Desai, we all know from ANOVA in Virginia, who, who uh, runs everything, I think, um, and, and is, is a, a remarkable uh, uh, mind when it comes to bringing efficiencies together. Thank you for joining us. I look forward to our discussion. Please make this interactive. Matthew? Bill, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, my task this morning is to talk about the role of mitral tear, mitral clip therapy in patients with heart failure. And it's been just a real paradigm shift in the last five, eight years of how we've treated our patients with functional MR. Here are my disclosures. All right, I thought I'd start with a case. Um, um, and uh, Phil mentioned my colleague and friend, Dr. Ajay Srivastava, um, our heart failure specialist at Scripps Clinic. We took care of this patient together. You may remember this patient, Ajay. So when she presented to us, she was 55 years old at the time, had a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. She was severely symptomatic, dysmic at 50 feet, unable to climb her stairs at home. She had orthopnea and really was out of work um, for the last 15 months or so. She had multiple prior heart failure admissions, and she was on really good medical therapy, 
on Coreg, Digoxin, and Tresto. Spironolactone, torsamide. We did not have an SGLT2 inhibitor at the time. She had a Nero QRS, QRS, so she was not a candidate for CRT. And her KCCQ score at baseline was 45, which is quite poor. So she was miserable and symptomatic. So stepping back, when we think about addressing mitral valve regurgitation, it's critical that we categorize the mechanism of MR because the treatment pathways may be different. On the one hand, we have primary valve regurgitation, which is a degenerative process of the leaflets, the subvalvular apparatus, and or the cordae and papillary muscles. And in contradistinction, there is secondary or functional MR where you have left ventricular dilatation leading to leaflet tethering, excuse me, or mitral annular dilatation, which in turn leads to incomplete coaptation of the mitral valve. And these two pathologies are easily seen both on transthoracic and transesophageal echocardiography. So figuring this out is key to how we're gonna treat our patients. On the left, you see in the TE that prolapse, flail, posterior leaflet, leaflet abnormality, primary MR, and then on, the, on our right-hand side, like our patient, you have left ventricular dysfunction, shifting or, or tethering of the leaflets towards the apex with mitral annular dilatation, leading to incomplete coaptation of the valvular leaflets, and then leading in turn to significant mitral regurgitation. So the COAP trial was a landmark trial studying the safety and efficacy of transcatheter mitral valve edge-to-edge -edge repair with the mitral clip in patients optimally treated with medical therapy, with functional MR. So this was about four, 610 patients with either three plus or four plus MR who remained symptomatic, remained with severe three plus, four plus MR despite maximally tolerated GDMT led by a heart failure specialist. So this was a heart failure trial. So people like Dr. Srivastava and others would manage those patients. And when they said to me, or when Ajay said to me, you know, I've done what I can, let's randomize this patient to either Metroclip plus continued GDMT or GDMT alone. Here are the primary endpoint at two years. One of the primary endpoints, all-cause mortality at two years, significantly and substantially reduced in the patients randomly assigned to mitraclip plus GDMT. The numbers are important. We just saw a, uh, a LBCT presented this morning looking at, at LDL reduction. There was a 70% relative risk reduction in a four component major adverse cardiovascular event. And that was deemed a huge win in the pharmaceutical industry. The mitraclip led to a 17% absolute risk reduction in mortality at two years. This is a huge reduction. In fact, you only needed to treat about six patients to prevent one death at two, at two years. The 38% relative risk reduction in mortality. So not only is the p-value significant, the clinical significance is substantial. What about heart failure hospitalizations? We like to keep patients out of the hospital. Mitraclip therapy with GDMT led to a 47% relative risk reduction in heart failure hospitalization with the number needed to treat of only 3.1 at two years. Very effective therapy. Another thing to look at is when the, um, the, uh, the curves begin to spread, right away after therapy. And we know this when we're doing the procedure, we can monitor left atrial pressure continuously during the procedure, and we see remarkable reductions in left atrial pressure instantaneously when we fix the mitral valve. So that patient goes from, say, a mean LA pressure of 24 to 17. They wake up the next morning. They've unloaded their LV. You're going to see clinical benefit right away, and that's what we saw in the clinical trial. What about continued follow-up? Well, there was a sustained benefit of mitral tear therapy with a mitral clip in these patients with significant FMR. Average EF is about 30%. At three years, there's still a mortality reduction with a number needed to treat of, of about eight, and that's despite the fact patients were allowed to cross over from the GDMT only arm to getting the mitral clip at two years. So there's, there's gonna be some um, diminution in the effect just because you have crossover to therapy. What about heart failure hospitalization? Even at three years, a 
relative risk reduction, and still a number needed to treat of only three. I'll give a little pitch tomorrow. Greg Stone's presenting the five-year outcomes of the COAP trial, and I'm excited to see the results um, regarding the sustained safety and efficacy of mitral tear with the mitral clip and FMR. Well, what about quality of life? Quality of life is important. We may keep our patients alive, but if they're miserable, that's not a very good way to live, right? Prolonging suffering. The mitra clip with GDMT led to a substantial and durable improvement in quality of life by about 16 points, and then at two years by about 12.8 points. So their patients were two and a half times more likely to experience a large improvement in health-related quality of life. What do these numbers mean? Well, anything more than five points is considered a large increase in quality of life, improvement in quality of life. So 13 is a pretty profound number. In fact, if you want to think about how this number compares to other heart failure therapies, this is a nice um, slide that, that Jonathan Spurditz of Kansas City um, allowed me to use in my presentations. These are a, a, a panoply of heart failure trials with control arms. And you see in the x-axis the different trials, and the y-axis is the mean difference in KCCQ scores. And here, co-apt, a 16% increase, excuse me, a, an absolute increase of 16 points. Now, um, you know, SGLT2 inhibitors are really, is now a really key part of our armamentarium and heart failure. So the DAPA trial, KCCQ in increase of only 2.3. Entresto, we love Entresto. My, my colleagues love Entresto. Patients need to be on Entresto. Yes, improves at clinical heart endpoints. Does not change how they feel at all, right? So Mitraclip is a therapy that both improves survival, keeps you out of the hospital, and makes you feel better, which I think is the trifecta. Well, um, where are we going in the future here? So this is a, a, um, a subgroup, sub-study analysis by Cybel Carr from the COAP data looking at MR at 30 days and whether it's prognostic of heart failure, hospitalization, or all-cause mortality in the co-op trial, grouping the two arms together. So this is both CLIP and medical therapy. And you see that if you get down to, if you have a sustained three plus or four plus MR, your likelihood of having a heart failure, hospitalization, or all-cause mortality is quite high. Really no significant difference between one plus or two plus. So it's really important to get down to two plus MR, no matter how you do it, be it medical therapy or with a device. There are some numerical differences between these two. I don't know whether there'll be a difference between two plus or one plus if you get a big enough cohort of patients. The interesting thing here though is that this is actually some historical data because our MitraClip device has changed. The co-op trial is gen one essentially. We're now on gen four of the MitraClip. So what is Gen 4? Well, we now have the ability to tailor our therapy to the anatomy of the patient. We now have four clips to choose from, both uh, normal size and long arms, normal width or larger width, which allows us to treat larger gaps, broader jets, get, I, I think, a better result overall safely. And in fact, we do get a better result that's been borne out now in large observational prospective registries, both the EXPAND study, which is the G3, and then we'll be reporting the EXPAND um, um, G4 study um, shortly. So in fact, on the left here is, is the EXPAND study, so this is a third generation device. And in this one year outcomes, in the EXPAND G4, excuse me, the EXPAND registry, about 300, 250 patients with functional MR. 93% of the patients at follow-up had one plus or less MR, compared to 71% in the COAP trial. So profoundly different, better results. So I anticipate we may get even better results in the future with our FMR patients. So let's go back to um, our case study here. So this was this 55-year-old female with severe mitral regurgitation, heart failure admissions, she's miserable, her KCCQ score is less than 50. So she was actually enrolled in the continued access for COAPT. She received a single NT device. This is the baseline. You see her left ventricular size, her left ventricular end diastolic diameter is 62, her left ventricular end diastolic volume index is 83, her EF is 39%. She went home the next day with trace MR. 
EF goes down a little bit, we expect that because of the increased afterload, but her forward flow has actually improved. She dilated a little bit in the next day. But look at 30 days. She's about a little bit better back to where she was at pre-procedure. And now at one year, her ejection fraction went from 39 to 51%. Her left ventricular and stock volume index is about half or uh, two thirds of what it was. She has normal left ventricular size. She was not hospitalized. She has not been hospitalized since her procedure. And she's actually been able to come off some of her, her, her diuretics. So a big win for this patient. So in summary then, how do we change the course of heart failure for our patients with secondary MR? We know that three plus and four plus MR is associated with adverse outcomes. The mitochondrial therapy has proven and durable results for our heart failure patients for at least three years. We'll see the five-year data tomorrow with a 33% reduction in mortality. And I think it's more important to talk about a 17% absolute risk reduction in mortality with a number needed to treat of only about six at, at two years. 51% reduction in heart failure hospitalization at, at three years. Significant and sustained SMR reduction now with, the, uh, with at least the third generation clip. I expect it to be even better with the fourth generation clip. And it allows us to, to tailor our therapies for our patients based on mitral valve anatomy. And Phil, I'll leave it at that. And I, I'll, I'll introduce my colleague, Ajay Srivastava, who is a heart failure specialist. Why is it that heart failure doctors get to be specialists? And no one else does, I'm not sure. Um, I'm Dr. Srivastava's fellow at Scripps Clinic, and Ajay has really been leading the charge for us um, in novel therapies and heart failure. And has really been a leader in, for, for Scripps Health in deciding who should get mitral transcatheter edge to edge repair therapy with the mitral clip and how to manage these patients. So, Ajay, thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everyone. And uh, yeah, it's a good uh, full house. Uh, thanks, Matt, for that kind introduction. It's always interesting to follow interventional or electrophysiology where, you know, they have all these pretty pictures, videos to show, and then I come on from heart failure. One of these days, I'm going to make this animated video, you know, with the diuretic going through the kidneys and flushing out stuff. Um, I have to make heart failure more interesting. That's one of our goals. Um, <clears throat> so we have, you know, a little bit about our program at um, Scripps, uh, and I think this is relevant when we think about working across um, divisions or um, ca cardiovascular subspecialties. So we're not a closed academic institution. We are pretty much an open institution. We have different groups, um, and we are part of a foundation, and getting... so so. It has some real-world implications in terms of how do we get protocols across and get folks from different, you know, sort of um, divisions to come together and agree to follow a certain path in how we manage these patients. It's challenging. It's not easy. Um, but I do think um, this is the work for all of us to do. How do we work across different subspecialties? get people across silos to work together in identifying these patients at the right time for the right therapy, and then how do we follow patients after they have a certain procedure done, whether it's an AF ablation or a transcatheter mitral valve repair, and who still owns the patient and helps quarterback the care for these patients after a given procedure, because the underlying pathophysiology and hemodynamics still remains, and that patient needs to be treated and managed. So I'm going to focus uh, for a few minutes on um, CardioMEMS. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with CardioMEMS, uh, it is a pulmonary artery sensor placed in the distal pulmonary artery in the left PA. It has an external ante antenna, which comes in, shown here as the electronic system or the pillow. And then you have data that goes to the cloud and can be viewed on um, a dashboard by the uh, clinical team to guide management of these patients. What this PA sensor does, it basically has a capacitor, a coil, a capsule surrounding it. There are no, there's no internal battery or internal leads. Uh, it's an external transmitter. So once you put a sensor in a patient, it can last for the life of a patient, and there's no battery change or any of that required. A very low complication procedure. It's basically a right heart catheterization followed by a wire, a pulmonary angiogram, 
and placement. The procedure done via the IGA takes about 30 minutes um, or less um, to implant, including a right heart catheterization. What it does, it gives us PA systolic, diastolic, and mean PA pressures to guide management of these patients. So why are we talking about PA pressures and what role does it have to play? I think we've all been sort of, you know, we talk about heart failure management and picking up decompensation using a weight scale, and this is how heart failure was always approached. What I'd urge you to think about heart failure, similar to how we do for systemic blood pressure, where we, you know, look at blood pressure it's, and the effects of hypertension sometimes are not immediate. Yes, when the blood pressure is 220, 230 systolic, but someone living at a systemic blood pressure of 150, 160, 170 takes, it, takes its toll on the patient over years. So same concept over here for right-sided measurements, prolonged PA pressures over time take a toll on the kidneys, take a toll on the right ventricle, and in addition to making the patient immediately feel better, our goal here is to reduce the long-term morbidity associated with pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary venous hypertension. So proactive management of bringing these pressures down, not waiting until downstream where the patient gains weight um, is how we like to think of this device in helping changing the long-term trajectory of these patients with heart failure. And, and we, because we understand, heart failure is a chronic disease and it stays over time, right? So as much as you make an acute intervention or a procedure, our goal is to prevent these frequent decompensations that can happen with each hospital admissions or each decompensation. So this sensor allows us to stay ahead of the curve and not wait for each you know, weight gain episode to then do something uh, for the patient. And this is data of looking at the functional improvement with a PA sen sensor guided management for patients with heart failure. And Matthew showed, this uh, showed a similar slide earlier for transcatheter mitral valve repair patients, where if you looked at what type of patients were enrolled in the COAPT trial, the, the outcomes, I mean, the results were impressive, right, for COAPT heart failure hospital admissions, mortality, 40% of the patients in COAPT did not require a hospital admission the year prior. And, and, and I think, I mean, that is extremely important. I mean, a lot of times when we get referrals, people, you know, it's after they've had two or three hospital admissions um, or more in the preceding year. But if they've had no heart failure admissions, no hospital admissions for heart failure in the preceding year, and yet, COAPT was able to show such dramatic differences in outcomes post-intervention. It just shows that, you know, maybe heart failure admission is an sub extremely subjective measure, and we should be, you know, not using that as much, as much as, yes, the initial indications are that way, but in terms of picking up patients who would benefit. Along with that, I'll make another point. 40% of the patients generally are NYHA class 2, um, and I think we all know from our patients we take care of, on a good day, you're class two, on a bad day, patients are class three. So essentially, I tend to lump class two and class three in the same category, because if you take COAPT, if you take Champion Trial, if you take Guide HF, you know, all these trials, I mean, it's, it's the, the patients in class two and class three is almost the same percentages, and that translates into then a um, improvement when you look further at the numbers between these two groups. So what Guide HF did was, Champion was the first trial, first randomized control trial for cardiomems, and looked at patients with prior hospital admissions, NYHA class three, class four. What Guide HF did was then saying, okay, if we applied that concept, but now looked at NYHA class two, and also did not require heart failure hospital admissions, but looked at an elevated NTBNP as a marker of heart failure, can we then use PA pressure guided management to make a difference for these patients? I mean, one of the challenges with this trial was, as you know, was done in the midst of COVID, uh, which affected event rates even in the control group, 
uh, with people not going out and not living a normal life. Um, so that affected the final results of the study. But if you still looked, I mean, there was in the pre-specified COVID uh, analysis, there was a trend towards improvement in uh, symptoms and heart failure hospital admissions in patients with PA pressures. And then if you looked at the totality of evidence that has been generated with PA sensor guided heart failure management, you'd see that, I mean, there's at least a 37, 35% reduction in heart failure hospital admissions when using objective measures such as pulmonary artery pressures to guide not just diuretic management, but uptight rating heart failure GDMT and patient convenience as well, uh, where patients don't have to come in every few weeks for volume assessment. So this was a paper that uh, of, we did, uh, Matt Price, myself, and uh, Chavelle, um, and a few other authors, basically said, okay, let's take the patients with mitral regurgitation, see how many, how many of those patients had a cardiomems prior, and let's see what the transcatheter mitral valve edge to edge repair did. You know, if the hypothesis is in the coap population, it's high filling pressures, they have mitral regurgitation, what were their PA pressures before? What were the PA pressures after? How much did mitral clip bring the PA pressures down? How soon did it bring the PA pressures down? And what was the delta in, uh, in that difference? So we started with about 230 patients who underwent tear between 2014, 2020, and then looked for complete data sets of patients who had three months of consistent measurements pre, three months of consistent measurements post, and looked at 50 patients, and here's what we found was transcatheter mitral valve repair brought PA pressures down, and you have two um, graphs over here. So one shows you just PA pressures before and after tear, and then the second graph on the right shows you patients who had an, just the elevated PAD above and what it did. So you can see with tear, both groups, all comers, as well as in the folks with elevated PA pressures, you did bring the PA pressures down with transcatheter mitral valve repair, which fits with co-apt results. I mean, patients feel better. There's less heart failure hospital admissions. So we achieved that. We were able to demonstrate that. But then what you see further, these PA pressures don't return to normal. So there is still w ways for us to go in helping these patients feel better to derive the full long-term benefit from tear, and that can be done by me knowing what their PA pressures are, pushing medical therapy more, pushing diuresis more, and um, further treating the patient after the intervention has been done. So I'll conclude by saying that, you know, I think CardioMEMS uh, as a PA sensor allows objective management of heart failure, similar to, you know, how we manage systemic blood pressure or hypertension by looking at a blood pressure value. And, it, and, it's, and I think weight-guided management doesn't do justice for the full management of heart failure as we could do with knowing what the PA pressures are. Um, thank you and look forward to the discussion. I think my next um, speaker, I think, is uh, Shashank Desai, as uh, Dr. Adamson mentioned, um, runs the program at Innova and will share um, his programmatic um, experience and how they've developed their program between heart failure and structural working together. Excellent, thank you, Ajay. So part of the question that remains unanswered is that you look at data like mitral valve repair, and the question is how in a health system do you actually implement this? And one of the things that we have to be careful about is that the idea of goal-directed medical therapy, optimal medical management, we've done a pretty abysmal job up to this point. And if you think about it, mitral valve clip is not the only device. Biventricular pacing, CRT, ICD, was all supposed to be optimally medically managed prior to implementation. And in this country, we have actually done pretty bad job. If you look at this data, where you look at the number of patients that are getting the absolute maximum dose of, as Dr. Price said, Entresto and Coreg, and you're talking about less than 1% of the population. And right, the warning here is that if you look at the COAP trial, it was a horribly positive trial with regards to mortality. There was a European trial in which 
medical therapy was not optimized, and the outcomes were not as good. So the clip is great, the meds are great, and they all, all have to go together. So the issue of how do you create a process is one that the national coverage decision for mitral valve clip was very different from how we implemented bivy pacing and ICD in this country. And so the question that faces most of you as programs is how do you implement this to be successful and to be durable? Because at the end of the day, if you don't show value after you clip those patients, you're not gonna be able to redo this data in your patient population. And again, in the payers, as far as the health system, this is gonna be an important part of it. So I put up here part of what the idea between the NCD coverage decision was, and I focus you more specifically on the heart failure cardiologist, right? So the heart failure cardiologist that's supposed to be part of this team is supposed to be experienced in the care and management of advanced heart failure patients, but it does not specify that they have to be board certified. And as you look at across the country, there's only 120 transplant programs in the country. There might be a few VAD programs here and there, but again, the number of programs that are going to be implementing structural heart is gonna far exceed the number of heart failure transplant programs. So the ability to generalize this is gonna be vastly important. And one of the things I'm gonna put up for you is a model that we implemented, despite us being a transplant program, that may be more generalizable to programs that don't have heart failure cardiologists that are board certified. But again, if you look here in the evaluation phase, right, there is a requirement for having a heart failure cardiologist. And again, the experience part, not board certified, is gonna be an important piece of this. These are the people that are on our heart failure team. We call it the interventional heart failure team. And the fact is we do have several interventional cardiologists that has grown since this slide was developed. And we've got a few heart failure cardiologists, but probably the most important piece are the advanced practice providers. We've actually built the heart failure component around the advanced practice providers in a way that th makes this most efficient. So if you look, we actually um, put in for a single center grant. Um, this is our project where we implemented a heart failure managed structural heart program. And the question is, in the real world, can we redo the co-op data? And what are our processes for doing this? And if you look at this, the fact is, if you find a patient that has 3 plus MR and they are optimally medically managed and you say, yes, they are optimally medically managed, they go directly for heart failure sign off and directly into the uh, cath lab. If they are not, they get referred for heart failure optimization. And we have an entire heart failure optimization clinic that actually is time limited. So we actually have a protocol, we have APPs, they bring these patients in on an every two week basis and they get them up to goal directed medical therapy, they get their repeat imaging. If they remain three plus, they actually get heart failure attending sign off and they get a certificate of graduation from that up titration clinic and only then can they walk into the cath lab. If, and actually this happens more often than you would think, they get optimized on medical therapy, their MR goes away, they continue to be followed longitudinally. And the question of where they get followed longitudinally is gonna be a question that each institution has to raise. But the fact is we have very distinct guidelines. So it doesn't matter if we have one APP who does it most of the time is on vacation, another one steps in, the clinic runs 52 weeks a year. They have a very clear step-by-step -step checklist. We actually have a protocolized note in EPIC that um, looks at the goal-directed medical therapy, and at the end of each note, it is not only are they on drug, but at what date did they complete the uptitration and what did they cause, what was their cause of failure? So in retrospect, we can go back and say, these people were uptitrated up to this point and they failed because of these reasons. Because part of what I want you to do is I want you to start thinking or understanding how a heart failure doc thinks. Right, so when Ajay and I look at a patient, right, we have this longitudinal care of patients. And, and I throw this patient up there because the question that annoys my interventionalists the most is I ask them the question, at what cardiac index will you not put a mitral valve clip in? At what peak VO2 will you not put a, car, a mitral valve clip in? Right, these are unanswered questions. And when you realize that Heart failure docs, when you're taking a stage C patient to stage D, 
or class four into advanced therapies, that data doesn't exist in all of these other therapies. So we're speaking two different languages. Right? This is sort of probably the way Ajay and I would look at a patient. This is a patient I had since 2014, ended up needing transplant in 2020. But over the six years, these were the tests that I obtained. Right? We get a frequency of right heart catheterization on patients. Right? This person got five catheterizations on the right side over the five years. Right? If they had cardiomems, we would absolutely have four more numbers. We get an echo, but we get an echo. I only got five echoes on this patient as well. As many echoes following a heart failure patient as I did right heart cats. We do functional assessment. This is a cardiopulmonary exercise test. And what you can see is you can see the peak exercise tolerance in this individual dropping. You can see other parameters. We use this VEVCO2 slope. And again, we can come back for another lesson on cardiopulmonary exercise testing. But you can see a very slow, steady rise in these patients. And if I were to say this patient is non-ischemic and has severe MR, at what point along this curve on the way to transplant is the optimal moment to put in a, a mitral valve clip? And these are unanswered questions. And this is a question that you as an institution are going to have to develop, and you're going to have to have a process. And we will get this data over some time. So this evolution of decision making, I'll put side by side three patients that I specifically had. And notice the era, the difference in decision making, right? So this is one of my all-time favorite patients. In 2014 to 2017, this 42-year-old actually was a genetically dilated cardiomyopathy many, many years. The EF was down, the LV started dilating and dilating, developed the functional MR actually before they even got into class four heart failure. She got into class four heart failure, had some VT, had initially reasonable VO2s and right heart catheterizations, was evaluated back in the time when COAPT was still under investigation and was accepted for the mitral valve clip study. And remember, this has been going on for some 20 plus years. All of us as heart failure docs prior to this data was were highly skeptical. And the discussion we had with her was, we don't know if this mitral valve repair is going to do anything. Why don't we just keep going with medical therapy and you're going to need a transplant soon. It's not a question of if, it's now a question of when. So two, three years later, we see the VO2 dropping, we see the cardiac output dropping. She underwent LVAD implantation because she's young as a bridge to transplant. You move forward, 2022 after the data's out, this is a 70 year old. He's ischemic, has the BIV, is optimally medically managed, has PAF, has CKD. This is sort of the classic sort of elderly patient within the heart failure clinic where you're not looking at a lot of options, develops class four heart failure, severe MR, is now being admitted for volume overload. We write heart cath him, the wedge is okay after 40 pounds of diuresis, but the cardiac index is low. We get sent this patient for evaluation for LVAD. And for LVAD, this guy is a down the middle of the road great LVAD candidate. His end organs aren't completely damaged, yet meets all the criteria for having a short, poor-term prognosis, right? If you need an LVAD in this country, you have to have a 50-50 one-year mortality. And these numbers are starting to predict that. But the fact is that mitral valve clip data is interesting and is out there. And so this guy was one of our first low cardiac output, low VO2. Let's see if a mitral valve clip can work. And actually, he felt awful for the first three months. And remarkably, three months later, started coming up out of this. And of course, you know, like Ajay said, you have to have longitudinal care. We swan all of these patients thereafter if they don't have uh, cardiomems in. And the, car the cardiac output started rising. And this guy's now been able to be managed on oral diuretics. 2023, I've got a 76-year-old that was the exact same way, right? LVIDD of 7.7, .7, severe MR. I mean, again, in 2014, this was not a guy I would have sent to mitral valve repair consideration had a cardiomems in place, you could see the progressive PAD um, elevations, refractory to diuretics, would not be able to IV diuresome, worsening class four, right? VO2 was awful, the VEVCO2 slope was steep, cardiac index was awful. Again, evaluated him for an LVAD, had these conversations. So the conversation has changed. And the conversation I'm having is we can go straight to an LVAD or we can give this mitral valve clip thing a try. Because again, it may be outside of what we think is indicated and remarkably, this guy got the clip, got a great result, had actually one to two plus MR, and to the point that was raised earlier, I'm actually wondering if a little bit of MR in these very, very poor ventricles is what allows them to tolerate the clip and allows them to actually improve as opposed to completely shutting down that mitral valve and having them crumb. Um, 
But the idea is, is mitral valve clip a bridge to advanced therapy? And so it is an interesting question that has yet to be answered. And so when you start looking at the idea of a heart failure program or a cardiology program that's expert in managing heart failure patients and how you integrate the CardioMEMS data, GDMT, the use of mitral valve clip, the monitoring thereafter, if you've got CardioMEMS in place, the adjustment to GDMT, as you know, go to some of these heart failure trials, there's three more drugs coming out. There's multiple other devices coming out for heart failure. So this is probably one of the things on the continuum before you get to advanced heart failure therapies. And the idea of having a structural program that has a longitudinal component, so you know what the value of what you're doing is gonna be very important. So I will end here and see if anyone has any questions. All right, well thank you very much. So we've seen now the remarkable outcomes of the COAP trial and the long-term follow-up. We've seen the utility of pulmonary artery pressure monitoring and how those two modalities can actually be complementary and how a multidisciplinary program really does bring to the patient the longitudinal care that I think we all want to provide for, the, for our patients. So let's have some, some discussion. If, if there is a question in the audience, please come to the microphone, identify yourself, and, and we'll, we'll discuss your question. I'm going to start uh, because many times, especially first day, we're not really ready to get up and ask a question, but get your questions. Let's come up to the microphone. My first question is timing, and, and Shashank, you, you talked about timing. What, what about earlier sort of intervention? Now, we, we many times identify patients and their disease based on their symptoms. They come to us and complain of the problems. We then functionally classify them. And yet, many times, as, as Ajay mentioned and showed, uh, the class two patients, when you look under the hood, really are sicker than we thought they would be based on the symptoms that they have, uh, they have told us about. So, Matthew, let's talk about the possibility of earlier sort of identification and building that kind of bridge from uh, community cardi cardiologists to those who utilize interventional valvular products. Right, and, and I just want to say, Shashank gave a great presentation. I want to congratulate you. And he brought up some really good discussion points. Um, how much MR do we really need to reduce? What is truly optimal medical therapy? Um, and and, um, and that sort of ties into also is where in the treatment pathway do we refer to mitral tier? And you mentioned before you have this graduation process. And I think one of the challenges, maybe both you and, and Ajay can comment on this as well, is at what point is optimal optimal? I, we see, I see many patients who um, don't tolerate those medications. So although you can say a small percentage of patients are on a Tresto, Many patients don't tolerate them, they can't afford those therapies. And although we do see patients who respond very well to, with GDMT and CRT, let's not forget, they can resolve their MR, there are patients who have like, a, a large amount of MR where medical therapy, going, you know, doubling the dose of interest domain was probably not gonna do much. So and there are those that we struggle with, well, we want to keep this patient out of the hospital, or are we going to wait eight weeks or 12 weeks to optimize that therapy? Can you comment on that and, and where, I mean, is there a, is there, and to use your graduation analogy, is there a short track where you don't have to go through the entire uh, process to get to the tier? Yeah, I'll take the first stab at that. I mean, I think I agree with you. I think that, you know, when we talk about early, you've got to look at the people that we're looking at. These patients are going to be dead within two to three years, yeah. right? And so I think that up titration used to be a luxury. We used to do it by different docs. Honestly, the ATP run, rapid up sequencing, up titration needs to be the integral part. I think we got to keep the docs out of it. And they've got somewhere between six to 12 weeks, depending on what dose they start at. And it better be done by 12 weeks. And then we can start making all the decisions that you so I think that that's vastly important before they start falling into, well, LVAD and transplant is going to be right. the only thing that... And and, and, right, and that's to Ajay's point as well, is um, that, you, that you made, is that if you... I notice, at least in rolling the co-op trial, it's not like 
you're giving therapy and then, uh, okay, now they're hospitalized, now it's time for mitral tear. That's not the trigger for tear is, oh, now they've failed therapy and they've been hospitalized. If after therapy they continue to be a little bit symptomatic, that's your, that's your trigger, right? Yeah, I mean, I think for, you know, when we look at the barriers and friction as to, you know, when it comes to referring patients for therapies, uh, you know, I think Shashank's bringing up some workflow processes yeah. that they've implemented. Then there are patient factors and, you know, there is this inertia of waiting till some magic happens. Um, but I, I, I do think our reliance on hospital admissions for heart failure as a trigger for any treatment, whether it's cardiomims, whether it's mitral clip, whether it's LVAD eval, I, I think that needs to change a bit. I think we need to pay attention or, you know, be, you know uh, approach patients irrespective of heart failure admission or not, because we can implement five things outside and keep them out of the hospital, but the disease process will still be progressing. So using objective data as opposed to a subjective hospital admission, um, and especially with the landscape where the ER, the hospitalists, you know, there are incentives to not admit patients yeah. and get them out. And while it looks good on paper, they're not admitted. But I bet if you did a right heart cath on those patients or a VO2, as Shashank said, you're going to see numbers that reflect the disease. So using any data to reflect the disease rather than an event uh, is, is my uh, opinion over there. We have a question. Hi, Tabitha Mo from Phoenix. I'm adult congenital. Um, I'm curious how you see this trajectory for each of these therapies in empowering our patients, because you've talked about your teams um, as opposed to the patient side of things. So are we looking to create a patient portal on Merlin.net? Are we looking to create a patient portal that is an app on their phone? You know, we now have all these wearables and patients are increasingly interested in their own data and accessing their own data and modifying their own treatment therapies you know, as they go. And so are we gonna get the, uh, are we gonna get the CardioMEMS device on their, on their watch and it says, hey, you're approaching heart failure. You should take more, uh, more, of, your, more of your loop diuretic or, or whatever. Um, so how do we f sort of flip the script and engage our patients in controlling their own data and controlling their own status? Well, I'll take the first stab at that. I think uh, you, you've, you've hit a, a, a really important point. And the, uh, one, of the, one, of the one of the most important group of, of healthcare workers that we have traditionally ignored are the patients. <laughs> and they're with themselves all the time. So I think it is important for us to get information to them. Uh, in particular and specifically for CardioMEMS, we do envision the, the next step to have a physician-directed patient self-management concept in which pressures are placed on a smartphone map that then is in the context of your prescription that is, uh, that is resident in that program, essentially. So they get the pressure, they get what you want them to take along with other educational opportunities that you can imagine. I'm, you know, you're in the high range, this is how you get there, 20 second video from you saying, hey, think about these things as you intensify your diuretics. It, it will happen and it is, it is I think, where we are, are going in the field, especially in the field of diagnostic information that can stream into empowering the patient. Um, what, do you, what, do you think about, what do you think about patient awareness of these therapies? Uh, it, to, to, to follow up on your point, how, do you think patients know what's available for them, or should they? Or Shashank, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I think if uh, blood sugar and Libre are any indications, right, they're the most invested. And honestly, at the end of the day, right, like you said before, this is a pandemic. There's not enough. There's not enough cardiologists available to take care of all these patients. And if we don't take some of that responsibility, give it back to the patients, I think they're fully aware. And I think there will be more engaged and more invested in the success of the devices if they are part of the process. Yeah, sure. 
Well, that's a very insightful question. Thank you for, for bringing that up. And I think one of the things that, that, that is also apparent is, is uh, along that spectrum, there's a lot of opportunities our patients have, and sometimes they don't hear about them. And, and that's, uh, that's another piece of, of, of a puzzle that we have to work through. So, so let's go, let's go a, a little bit back to the, the question of earlier intervention, earlier identification. And Matthew, you brought that up, and I think that, you know, uh, how, how would you see ultimately the, the, the sort of best pathway? We saw how ANOVA brings together, an, and, and really, Shoshank, if I'm, just correct me if I'm not, if I'm making a, the wrong conclusion from your talk, but you really rely on APPs to not only maybe even identify candidates, but make candidates appropriately th treated and, and prepared for the intervention. So how, how would you bring those two things together? Yeah, I think, I think the structured approach is what's critical, is if I see a patient, <clears throat> let's say I happen to see a patient that gets me through another process, I do it. I get patients short of breath that are sent to me for a left and right heart catheterization. And I look back and I see an echo, so severe MR, and their wedge is high, their coronaries are fine. If that physician is not part of my hospital <coughs> structure, I say, hey, the MR is pretty bad. You might, <coughs> patients on good therapy, you might want to consider mitral tear. Okay, let me see what I can do. And that patient gets lost. Because they'll, they'll do what's right. I'm not saying they're not doing what's right. They'll increase the core egg, they'll start in Tresto, but they don't have the infrastructure with APPs and others to, get, to dial it in quickly. So uh, maybe, and, and Aji may want to come up with what we've done at Scripps Health in terms of a patient gets hospitalized with heart failure at Scripps Health. Wh whoever their doctor is, it doesn't matter. They, because of the issues with recurrent heart failure hospitalizations and the financial hit the hospital takes with Medicare, Scripps has taken a structured approach with APPs to make sure that patient is managed in a way that they don't come back and also is offered advanced therapies as needed, including TIER and, and CardioMEMS and, and LVAD, right? Yeah, I think it's getting better. I think we're all recognizing that, you know, heart failure requires population health approach to care as opposed to just a individual physician-based uh, approach that it's traditionally been, uh, or it still is for the most part. But I think, I mean, we don't have the bandwidth as physicians, you know, we have patients take care of research, doing all this stuff, that, that we can't really tackle this at scale. And I think different institutions and systems are implementing different styles and approaches of <clears throat> having protocols integrated into um, um, care at a higher level. And then based on, your, based on the payers, trying to uh, get that flow going. But I do think you know <clears throat> we should leverage EHR a lot more. Um, on this regard as well, <clears throat> in identifying patients who would benefit from care pathways and management, which we have really not done. I think there's a lot of opportunity over there. You know, we talked about the patient that gets optimized and their MR goes away. What do you do? Wipe your hands and say, congratulations, your MR has gone away. What's, what, what's the next year or two? for that patient? What, what, what do you suggest? Shoshank? Well, unfortunately, right, we saw this ever since uh, Bivy pacing came out in the late 90s, yeah. right, that heart failure will continue to progress. So you buy yourself time with each of these therapies. Unfortunately, they're not a cure, right? This is not an antibiotic for a toenail infection, right? It's not going away. And so hence the idea of longitudinal care for these patients, whether or not the mitral valve regurgitation will be back, whether or not dyssynchrony will be back, whether or not LV dysfunction will be back, heart failure, and eventually VAD transplant will be back. All of these things are more likely than not. Yeah, I mean, and, and if you even look at the, the treatment arm in COAPT, the heart failure hospitalization rate in the treated arm was about 35% at two years. Yeah. So there's more to be, I mean, we've done huge strides when you fix an MR, unload the left ventricle, but there's clearly things we can do. And, and you mentioned this is maybe um, the benefit of cardiomems in these patients. Correct. We don't know, right? But uh, what, how do we further optimize the care of these patients after successful transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair? 
Yeah, I think it goes back to the point that Shashank made. You know, when we do an intervention, I mean, the disease still remains. And then applying a process that works best for your clinic, your practice, your program is needed. I think what we, I think the challenge we face most is I think once a patient is referred, I see them from heart failure, Matt does a procedure, then how do you drive longitudinal management of that patient after if it's a referring cardiologist who happens to not be either of us for that particular patient, then how do we work and establish a relationship? Generally what we do is, you know, the patient goes back to uh, his or her cardiologist, they're taking care, and we'd like to say, maybe we'll see you back and we'd like to see you in six months to get a state where, where we are. And then in some cases we do three months, uh, but I do think having some post-intervention follow-up is required, yeah. and then you can identify a patient. You know, we've had some patients post-intervention, they get, they get a cardio MEMS to drive management, and they still remain with their regular primary cardiologist, but we use the device to up manage medications and stuff. I certainly think we can do better. We can definitely do better. Well, actually, Phil, let me just make a comment. Um, I, I, you know, I think, I think it is incumbent upon the health system that is managing the patient to provide value and outcomes, right? I mean, I think the world has switched, right? So the idea behind one physician, like Dr. Price said, well, I'll take care of this. You know what? The health system is now responsible, and we're going to be more and more responsible for these patients. And honestly, what we've implemented, which is going to be the next onslaught of patients, is we've actually implemented InView, which is a product that actually looks at sort of pillaging through the EMR, finding these patients. And then the next question is going to be, how are we going to manage all of these incidental mitral regurgitations patients, and how are we going to follow them? Because that's going to be the next epidemic of process management. But I think at the end of the day, it's going to be incumbent upon us as a health system to be able to manage the quality of outcomes. Well, I think it's a paradigm shift. And honestly, I don't like that word, and I, don't, I think it's kind of a catch word. But honestly, as I said at the very beginning, I encourage you to think integrated and yeah. integratively, because if the mitral regurgitation improves, that patient has heart failure. If the left bundle branch block is fixed with a cardiac resynchronization therapy, that patient still has heart failure. And at some point in time, we can no longer fire and forget. Yeah. We have to fix that component as best we can and put that into the overall continuum of that patient's disease. So I'm, I'm really thankful that you came here today. I hope this has been helpful. Um, and we're, we'll stick around, certainly, if you have any questions. But again, thank you. Thank you to the faculty. Yeah. Fantastic time. And let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much for coming.